We're back with one of six women candidates for the Democratic nomination. Our guest is the only one who is not a senator or congresswoman, but Marianne Williamson is an author of seven best-selling self-help books. She's also a spiritual advisor. Good morning and welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to pick up with a question I asked some of our other guests, mm -hmm. which is, is it important for Democrats to respond to tweets like the president has sent about uh, Elijah Cummings, or should you stay focused on issues? Well, first of all, that is an issue, and it's important for every American to respond. You know, Mr. Mulvaney said something very interesting to me on your show. When he was talking about what Elijah Cummings said, why the president came after him, Mr. Mulvaney said what he said was wrong. Now, Mr. Mulvaney did not say what he said was inaccurate, the idea of children sleeping in their own feces, et cetera. He said what, they, what he did was wrong. So really, this is demagoguery. This is beyond, you know, we use words like racism, but we need to understand, and every American needs to understand, the president sends out warning shots. You criticize me, I'm coming after you. That's why many Republicans will not take him on. That's why certain Republicans chose not to even run again. And now he's doing that with someone like the congressman. And I thought that was fascinating. What you did was wrong. It is wrong to come after me. That is how demagogues behave. You uh, are running on a platform with some proposals that involve some massive restructuring of the U.S. government. Sure. One of the things you're floating is this idea of creating a department of children. Children and youth, yes. H how is this different than what the Education Department does, and what is it that you're actually proposing? Well, the Education Department gets about $68 billion in the budget, and then within HHS, there is also the Agency of Children and uh, Child Working excuse me, children and families. That gets about $48 billion. Now, education is extremely important, but we have children who are traumatized before they even reach before they even reach preschool. We have a relatively high infant mortality rate. We have problems that go beyond the things that are already covered. We have problems with the fact that children have PTSD. Millions of American children have PTSD that is considered as severe as that of returning veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq. We have millions of American children who go to school every day, elementary school students who are asking their teachers if maybe they have some food for them. We have American children who go to classrooms where there aren't even the adequate school supplies with which to teach a child to read, and if the child cannot learn to read by the age of eight, the high school graduation uh, a possibility, probability is drastically decreased, and the chances of, high, of incarceration are drastically increased. So we need a holistic perspective. We need more than just educational funding. We need wraparound services. We need trauma-informed education. We need to deal with the nutrition of our children, the high poverty rates, the, vi the violence in our schools, the, the trauma-informed education. There are so many issues for the whole child that need to be addressed. As How, as, I'm sorry. So when it comes, though, to even public education, not yes. even the level of social services you're talking about, a lot of this is controlled at the state level. So how do you get Republican-governed <clears throat> states, in particular, to agree to fund everything you're laying out here and to actually implement? Well, let's talk about that. The truth of the matter is we are the only advanced industrialized nation that bases our educational funding on property taxes. So what this means is that a child in a in a financially advantaged neighborhood stands a chance, a good chance, of getting a very high quality public school education here. But if a child does not grow up, not live in a, in a financially advantaged neighborhood, then the opportunities are far less for a higher quality education. So how would you, you fund it? There should be a federal mandate. Two things are going on here. Some states have the money to do better, and they choose not to. Some states simply do not have the money. To me, this should be a federal mandate. Every When I'm president, if I'm president, the idea is that every school in America should be a palace of learning and culture and the arts. This is the way to create a peaceful society and a prosperous society years from now, and that's what we should be doing. Senator Kamala Harris says she wants to pay teachers more, a uh, $13,500 raise over four years. Is that the dollar amount you're looking for? I'm not looking at a specific dollar amount, but I certainly agree with the senator that we need to pay teachers a lot more. But you know what? That's, the, that's one out of so many things that need to be changed. That's just one, one thing. We have to talk about, about what even happens in these children's lives before they even get to school. I also also want to feel that the high stakes uh, standardized testings are not are not helpful at this point but we have to deal with so much more than as important as it is that we pay our teachers more, which is extremely important, we have to look at the whole issue of how American, America basically neglects millions of chronically traumatized children every single day. You mentioned health. Uh, you have clarified in recent days that your position is not one of an anti-vaxxer. 
Well, do there are people who say support pe vaccines. Well, what's happening in the world today is that anybody who has any kind of conversation that is not towing the line with big pharma is called an anti-vaxxer. I am pro-vaccine. I am pro-medicine, and I also find the fact that and you don't object to antidepressants either. You've clarified no, that. No, if people want to use antidepressants, and I do not like the predatory practices of big pharma, and I don't know why people. When we are seeing what's going on now with the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. where attorney generals all over this country country are now indicting these big pharmaceutical executives for what we now know to have been their role in the opioid crisis. I find it so odd that people are just assuming that in every other area, they're just the paragons of pure intent and concern for the common good. As commander in chief, what do you think America's role in the world should be? Moral leadership. Our grandparents would be rolling over in their graves to see something like, for instance, for the sake of a $350 billion arms deal over the next 10 years, we are giving aerial support to a genocidal war that Saudi Arabia is waging against Yemen. Tens of thousands of people have been starved, including children. Now, I'm not saying that America was ever perfect, but there was a time on this planet when other nations and Americans ourselves saw that when it came to international policy, we at least tried to so stand for democracy and humanitarian. Arabia. It's and not just about cutting funding to military. I want the military to have whatever it needs for legitimate security purposes. My critique is of political decisions that have more to do with short-term profit maximization for defense contractors. We need mm -hmm. to wage peace. Even Donald Rumsfeld, who was the Secretary of Defense, under, under George Bush said we must also wage peace, mm -hmm. which is why I want a U.S. Department of Peace. We need to far, uh, far uh, okay. beef up and, and support far more our peace-building agencies within the State Department. Well, we'll hear more about that on the debate stage this week, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we will be right back with our political panel. We now turn to our political panel for some analysis. Michael Crowley is a White House correspondent for The New York Times. Eliana Johnson covers the White House for Politico. Joel Payne is a Democratic strategist, and he appears frequently on our digital network, CBSN. And Ed O'Keefe also appears frequently on all CBS networks. We keep him very busy. He is our political correspondent here at CBS News. Uh, Joel, I want to start with you. Um, the president sent 13 tweets in 24 hours about Congressman Elijah Cummings. It ha changes the news cycle. It forces the question to be asked of all Democratic candidates, how they respond. Uh, what does this mean politically on the campaign trail when the conversation comes back to these divisive issues that are often perceived as being about race? Well, it's certainly distractive, and I think it forces all of the candidates to, you know, kind of have this come to Jesus moment about whether or not the president is racist. That's the question that everybody likes to ask, which I actually think it's rather obvious. You can kind of look into the president's soul when you look at his, at his Twitter platform or his Twitter, Twitter stream. But the bigger point here is the president is talking about things that normally are reserved for, you know, things at the far flung reaches of the party. Uh, people who are political advisors who are nameless like Lee Atwater or regional politicians like Jesse Helms. We really in the modern era have not had a president who's spoken like this, and the challenge it creates for Democrats, particularly when you're looking at things like impeachment and when you're looking at all of the other things that the Democratic Party is contending with, is whether or not they are going to challenge this president in a way that's going to be satiating to their base. And does it replicate in some way this conversation from 2016 about labeling people, the deplorables moment is what I'm thinking about with Hillary Clinton, when the conversation turns to the president's language being racist, do people internalize that and say, well, I'm with him because I think I'm being well, yeah. called a racist? Totally, and that's, and that's the risk they run in spending too much time talking about the president's words and intent. And, and it's why so many of these Democratic presidential candidates, just like Democratic lawmakers and Republican lawmakers, for that matter, are frustrated by this because they don't want to necessarily have to answer for everything he says. And that is going to be, continue to be the real challenge for Democrats out there. Do you talk about him? And what he's doing and saying, what he's trying to do and say, or do you try to focus on what you would be for if you are the Democratic nominee? It worked for Democrats last year running for Congress. Let's see if Democrats running for president can, can remain just as focused on everything else with whatever he's doing sort of being the constant that's always there, the elephant in the room that everybody knows about. Uh, and and it's, real, it's real tricky. We've seen some frustration from some of these candidates. I still remember what Amy Klobuchar said a few weeks ago. He does this to distract. 
you, and she pointed at reporters, from talking about the issues we are trying to raise on the trail, health care, uh, education funding, you know, all these other issues. And she has a point. Mm -hmm. Eliana, how is the Trump campaign feeling about all of this? I mean, we had some economic numbers this week. You saw GDP actually come down to about 2.1 percent, less than many had predicted. Or is there some softening or is there a reason for worry that would cause the need for a distraction or is this just the president popping off? Look, the, the one single thing that could really cause alarm in the Trump campaign is a downturn in the economy. A one-off statistic, uh, an economic downturn over one month, I, is not enough cause for alarm, but a persistent trend in that direction certainly is. So we're not there yet. Uh, I don't think you can link it to the president's comments. Uh, however, I do think the president's comments are uh, something of a strategy. They serve dual purposes. Uh, the comments directed at coming are a, a pushback on oversight. Uh, they originated from an African-American Republican operative appearing on Fox News in a discussion about uh, Elijah Cummings' role in oversight of what's happening at the border. So the president is saying this oversight is illegitimate, and it's also a way to animate both his base and part of a uh, sort of a uh, long shot attempt to gin up uh, uh, African American voters by saying uh, this person who served in Congress for over three decades is more focused on uh, investigating the president than he is on serving his own district. That's at the very least the argument that the president's making. And what is happening inside the White House around this, Michael? I mean, you heard the chief of staff saying none of this is racist. He understands why it's being interpreted that way, uh, but it's the president rejecting, basically, he says, illegitimate attempts at oversight. Yeah, well, I think it's very reactive, as has been the case throughout the Trump presidency. We know specifically on the tweets about AOC and Ilan Omar and the squad a week or two ago that White House aides did not see those tweets coming. I don't know specifically about the Cummings tweets. And there was a plan to try to get the president to dial them back and to say that they had been misinterpreted and instead the president doubled down and to the extent that the White House was trying to put some kind of a strategy around these tweets, the president didn't want to follow it. So I think as we've seen throughout this presidency, Trump is there basically in the residence frequently, Eliana, with a useful reminder, watching Fox News, responding to Fox News, that you almost can't exa overstate how much his public commentary is driven by what he's seeing on Fox and Friends, Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity's show. It's just an astounding phenomenon. And his aides are just trying to kind of reverse engineer from the tweets that they see. What did he mean? What's the strategy here? And then when they try to put some kind of strategy together for the second day, the president ignores it. Can, can I add to, you know, I think that there's this popular thought that this is a part of some supercharged strategy, the strategy to supercharge the base, to get the president's base excited. I don't know if the proof is there for that. You know, I looked at a recent Fox poll that said he had an 87 percent approval rating with Republicans. I looked at Mitt Romney's approval rating from 2012 when he was he was the Republican standard bearer. He was also at 87 percent. So I don't know if there's any proof that this Republican Party is more loyal to Donald Trump than other Republicans have been. I think there is standard loyalty to the Republican standard bearer. But I don't know if this strategy is working and it's actually pushing away moderates, it's pushing away swing voters. And you've seen three House Republican retirements this week. I wonder how much that's linked to the president's language of late. I think there's some truth to that. You know, I, I don't think there's strategy, but I think there's instinct with Trump. And I think his his instincts are often politically savvy. Um, and I, I think your point on Romney misses something in that uh, Romney was a conventional Republican who Republicans, the party followed to do conventional things. And I think the thing that's caught people's attention about Trump is that the Republican Party has followed him just uh, and stuck behind him to far more unconventional, outrageous uh, places that I think the country never really thought that uh, the party and uh, politicians would follow uh, somebody who had never been in politics before. Ed, tell me where the Democratic Party is headed this week with this round of debates. Uh, it, it's a big moment. I think anyone who doesn't think these things matter should look at uh, surveys taken in the last month since the first debates. Were we talking as much about Julian Castro or Kamala Harris a month ago before those debates? No, they had very good performances. Were the doubts about Elizabeth Warren's viability still there? Yes, and they've been somewhat diminished uh, because of the powerful performance she gave. So you have two interesting setups this week. You have to focus on the two people at the middle of the stage, probably most of all. Tuesday night, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, essentially, uh, you know, 
brothers and sisters in arms when it comes to sort of the liberal wing of the Democratic Party and the ideas they're trying to push? Do they go after each other? And how much incoming do they take from the lesser known moderates on stage with them that are trying to break into that top tier and hoping that they get a moment that buys them time into September? And then, of course, Wednesday night, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, round two. Uh, those of us who watch politics will pop extra popcorn for that one, probably, because <laughs> you wonder where that goes. Uh, the other X factor in that, of course, is Cory Booker, the New Jersey senator who still can't find any traction, but continues to be the guy that starts fights with the vice president and, and sort of forces conversation about some issues from the Veep's past. So uh, definitely a critical moment. And remember, the stakes are raised now going from July to September. Mm -hmm. you got to hit higher th polling thresholds, higher fundraising thresholds. So those that are struggling have to use Tuesday or Wednesday night to make that happen. Joel, did having special counsel Robert Mueller testify this week backfire for Democrats? I think that's going to be a popular thought. And, you know, listen, it's that old thing. If you listen to a debate on the radio, you, you might think that Democrats won on the points. But if you watched it in this era of Trump politics, this political theater, uh, the special counsel did not necessarily perform quite as well. I think the real takeaway for me is that the second happiest person in Washington after the president might be Speaker Pelosi. And it's because <laughs> her thought, her way of approaching impeachment probably wins out the week because now her caucus is a little bit more chastened in terms of their thought about moving forward with impeachment. We even saw Adam Schiff earlier this week said that it's very likely the only way to remove the president from office is at the ballot box, not through impeachment. And I think that that's significant for the speaker. Eliana, there was some reporting in the Washington Post uh, writing about Robert Mueller, who is 74, 75 years old. He is a, a peer of the president, but it was suggesting that there were real doubts and conversations conversations behind the scenes about whether he was up for it, for the kind of questioning that he endured. Is this a below the belt hit on a public servant or is this a legitimate question? I don't think it's below the belt, and I, I think it's the job of reporters to bring out to the public the stuff that we reporters are privy to uh, behind the scenes here in Washington. And those are the things that Mueller allies had been saying in green rooms and in the hallways of Congress. And I think uh, it was important for the public to know that these are things, and, and it would have been fair had Mueller been 64 or 54 or 44. Um, he happens to be 74, but these are the things that had been a real concern. Yes, they'd been uh, whispered by his critics with some glee, but also the people close to Mueller had expressed real concerns that uh, he was not up to this testimony. And I think uh, I think the American public saw that bear out um, that uh, on all day on Wednesday. It was, it was pretty painful. Uh, Michael, the president said he had a few wins this week on the immigration front. But one of the things he also counted as a win was what happened overseas. Yeah. Boris Johnson uh, ascending to become the prime minister of the U.K. He's described him as resembling himself. That's right. That's right. Well, this is going to be an amazing relationship to watch. Um, in some ways, these men are very different. I mean, Boris Johnson is um, a classical scholar, erudite, uh, uh, wrote a, a biography of Winston Churchill, um, loves to quote, you know, great literature. Um, a pretty different approach uh, than the president. At the same time, these men are both entertainers who have put their fingers on something in the pulse of our political moment in the world right now, which is a kind of populism, a kind of anything goes style. Uh, Boris Johnson sort of gleefully used the word dude uh, in his uh, in his first public speech, um, kind of breaking the old rules and projecting a, a sort of authenticity that people seem to be craving. Um, I think it's hard to know exactly substantively how this relationship works out, although we'll I will say it. the special relationship is probably going to improve. We will be watching it and we will be back in a moment. As tensions with Iran escalate, CBS News national security correspondent David Martin got rare access to U.S. troops serving in the Middle East. He spent 10 days with the top U.S. commander in the region, General Frank McKenzie. David's report begins at Prince Sultan Air Base in Saudi Arabia. Traveling with General Frank McKenzie, the top U.S. commander for the Middle East, was a journey across a landscape of past, present, and potentially future conflict. At an air base in the middle of Saudi Arabia, 500 American troops, protected by a battery of Patriot air defense missiles, are laying the groundwork for the worst case scenario against Iran. It looks like this is the beginning of preparations for if these tensions turn into a war. 
Well, I'd prefer to say it's like this. It's a signal that we're not going to be cowed by Iranian malign activities. I had been here before, in 1990, on the eve of the first Gulf War, when this base was chock-a-block with American warplanes ready to put out the lights in Baghdad. Now, nearly 30 years later, McKenzie was taking the first steps in another buildup, only this time to put out the lights in Tehran. How many planes could you bring in here? Uh, there have been a lot of planes here in the past. I won't get into exact details, but you could bring as many as you want. It hasn't come to that yet, but the U.S. and Iran remain on a collision course. Within the space of two days, as McKenzie flew over the Persian Gulf to Afghanistan, the USS Boxer took down two Iranian drones that came too close, and the Iranian Revolutionary Guards hijacked a British tanker. She was fired upon, subsequently boarded, taken under Iranian custody, and is now deep in Iranian territorial waters. Exactly the kind of incidents that could spiral out of control. So McKenzie cut short his visit to Afghanistan, where 14,000 American troops are still fighting America's longest war, and flew to Qatar, where the U.S. Luck, has the built state-of-the-art command centers to run Syria. these seemingly forever wars. General McKenzie is the top military commander, not just for the war in Afghanistan, but for Iraq and Syria as well. But 10 days of getting on and off airplanes with him has made it very clear his number one mission is war with Iran. How to head it off, and failing that, how to fight it. Next, McKenzie flew to a desert base in southern Syria in a scene straight out of a Mad Max movie. Those American special forces are part of the 1,000 U.S. troops still here, hunting down the remnants of ISIS. Not by coincidence, this base also sits astride the main land route which connects Iran to its Syrian allies in Damascus. We're standing in the middle of the Damascus-Baghdad highway, and the base is right in the middle of it, so certainly it blocks a, a major channel of communication. B-22 Ospreys carried us out of Syria, in-flight refueling required, for a visit to the Boxer, which had taken down those Iranian drones. Mission for green while we're ready. Nobody wants war, but as Captain Ron Dowdell told us, the Boxer is already counting its kills. So I expected to see the silhouette of a drone painted on your bridge. How come it's not there? Wait till we get in port. <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to David and CBS News cameraman Tony Furlow for their reporting. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. And if you miss the broadcast on television, Face the Nation can always be seen on CBS All Access, our network's digital subscription, video on demand, and live streaming service. You can download the app for both CBS News and CBS All Access on our website at facethenation.com. Replays are also on our digital network, CBSN.